in this book are all so important. They are so important. Don't miss anything. And don't miss any part of the sessions for these next five days. Don't miss anything. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. You see, he introduces the book so you understand why it's called a book of revelation. It's not just, it's not because it is a revelation. But there's a clear introduction. He tells us what the book is. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now when it says things which must shortly come to pass, the, the Greek communication is on the strength of its sudden, uh, it's coming to pass in quick succession. You get it? Not about, the focus is not only on its nearness, but in how quickly they will come to pass. Without digressing, um, there are several other scriptures where the same expression is used that gives the understanding that this is what it covers, what I just told you. It says, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now, look at two words here, servants and servant. The first one it says, God gave this revelation of Jesus Christ to him to show to his servants. What do you mean servants? And then he says, he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. So John is given as an example of God's servants. If you read in Revelation, uh, Romans, Romans chapter 1, verse 1, just for a second. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. A servant. Now that's the, the Greek word, doulos. Doulos is the word that's translated servant here. And here's what it really means. And I, I, I wrote out this for you. Now, metaphorically, it refers to one who gives himself up to another's will. One who gives himself up to another's will. One whose service is used by Christ in advancing his course among men. One that's devoted to another to the disregard of his own interests. And John is given as an example of that. One who's given up his own interests to advance the interests of another. So he calls John a servant of Jesus Christ. My question to you, is this book addressed to you? The Bible says this book was given, the revelation of Jesus Christ was given to him so he could show, he would show it to his servants. Things which must shortly come to pass. 
No wonder not many people understand the book of Revelation. Because it's for his servants. Those who have given up their own wills for the Father's will. Those who have disregarded their own interests for the interests of this one they serve. Are you his servant? This book is for his servants. Next verse. So he, he's referring to John in the, last, in, the, uh, in the last line of that verse one, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. See that? John bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. Remember, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave to him to show to his servants things which must shortly come to pass. These things will shortly come to pass, he says. All right. Verse 3. Now, this is, verses 1, 2, and 3 is a, is a prologue. It's John's prologue. And here, he says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. So the book of Revelation is a prophecy. See it? So number one, it is a revelation. And number two, it is a prophecy. It is a prophecy. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. So just reading it blesses you. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. Say, I'm blessed. Yes. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Mine, I'm blessed. Thank you, Lord. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. So if you're hearing the words of this prophecy, you are blessed. You are blessed. It is written. It is written. You are blessed. But there's more. He says, blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein. So you got to keep them. For the time is at hand. The time is near. If it was near back then, it is nearer now. The time is near, he says. Next verse. John, to the seven churches. So the, the prologue is, is concluded in verse 3. The book opens here. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. This had to do with Asia Minor. Grace be unto you, and peace from him that is, and which was, and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Seven churches. We're going to see the list shortly and mark them. It says John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is 
and which was and which is to come. What a declaration. I told you every detail in this book is important. And when we start throwing light into a lot of the things raised here, you don't understand why I'm telling you this. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne, the seven spirits. Now he's talking about seven churches. He's talking about the one who is, who was, and who is to come. In other words, he is in the present. He was in the past, and he is for the future. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne, next verse, and from Jesus Christ, okay, so the one that he addressed as was, uh, uh, is, was, and to come is God. The same one who gave the revelation to Jesus Christ. Because now he tells us grace from him, that one, who is, was, and to come, and from Jesus Christ. Right? Good. So he distinguishes between that one who sits on that throne, all right? He talked about the seven spirits which are before his throne. Then it says, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. So Jesus is declared here as a faithful witness. And the first begotten of the dead, first, first born from the dead, Remember, that is important. The first begotten of the dead. Begotten means to be born. The first born from the dead. Hallelujah. What a description. So mark that description. Jesus Christ, the first born from the dead. The first born of the dead in the prince of the kings of the earth. Look at that. The prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. This is Jesus Christ. He is called the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, the one who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He loved us, washed us from our sins. Observe the tenses. He loved us, washed us from our sins. He's not washing us. He washed us from our sins in his own blood, not the blood of bulls and, 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 and goats, but his own blood. Verse, remember the, the past tense. Unto him that loved us and washed us. See, he loved us. And so he washed us from our sins in his own blood. <laughs> Next verse, glory to God. And hath made us, and hath made us. He washed us from our sins in his own blood. It's, it's already done. And hath made us kings and priests. This is not a promise. It's not something he's hoping to do. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And everybody said amen. amen. Look at that. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. And hath made us. He washed us. See, he loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He's already done it. And hath made us. We're talking the finished works, the completed works, hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And everybody said amen, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 
He hath made us kings and priests. Another term is king priests. King priests. He made us king priests. And when you break it down in the Greek, it means royal priests. The word translated king there actually means royal. Royal priests. We are royal priests. <laughs> Glory to God. In the order of Melchizedek, that's why. Because Melchizedek was the king priest. King of Salem. Priest of the most high God. And Jesus Christ was made a high priest in the order. So there are different orders of priesthood. So this was a particular order. You know, the Aaronic order, Levitical priesthood, had to pass from one generation to another. The Bible says they were not allowed to continue by reason of death. You see it? But this one is another order. And the Bible says he lives forever. He lives forever. He had an unchangeable priesthood. It says in the order of Melchizedek, and it tells us about Melchizedek, no beginning of days, no end of life. Think about that. He had no beginning of days and no end of life. He says, he abides a priest forever. So Jesus comes and he is a priest, a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And we are born into this order of priesthood. This order of priesthood. He had made us kings and priests, royal priests, unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Hallelujah. This is wonderful. He had made us kings and priests, royal priests. Well, what, what does that mean? That means we've got responsibilities, right? We've got responsibilities. And it's amazing that he brings this in from the very beginning of this book to impress something into our hearts. Because he has this prophecy to deliver. And he understands that he's delivering the prophecy to royal priests. So what are they going to do about it? You know, I, I think about some things sometimes. You know, when I pray, I have nothing to ask God. I have, I have nothing to pray for, nothing to ask for. Why? I have one job. I understand my job. My job is very simple. My job is to deliver his agenda, that's all. To bring the Father's will to pass. Amen. I have no interests. His interests are my interests. What he wants is 100% okay for me, that's all. I have, no, I have nothing I want. I just want what he wants, that's all. Because I'm sent forth for that purpose. That's all. So I look at this and I can understand John's communication here. And why he wants us from the very beginning to understand that we are royal priests. A priest has no other responsibility than to attend to the one to whom he is priest. He says he's made us priests unto God. 
his father. So we are priests of God. So we have to understand our job, our responsibility. Why are you on earth? Why do you live? Why are you here? You know, Jesus said, he said the same thing. He says, my will, my work, my work, my assignment is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. To do it and finish it. That's what he said. He said, I have an assignment. My assignment is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Next verse. Behold, O Sagrodigo Alangasto Pradahades. Look at this. Behold, he cometh with clouds. Glory to God. Behold, he cometh with clouds. And every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Wow. Even so. Amen. I want you to remember this part we just read. Remember this part. Look at it again. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I want you to go to St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, and, and let's read from verse 29. Immediately, these are the words of Jesus. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give a light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Now, we, we, we're going to deal with this verse. We're going to come to this verse several times because of its key importance. But I want you to notice when he says it will happen. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. What days? We'll go to that later. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give a light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Next verse. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. All the tribes of the earth shall mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power. And great glory. Oh, Kasura Bahanda. With power and great glory. Great glory. Oh, oh, oh. oh. What's it going to be like? He'll come with power and great glory. But the tribes of the earth, he says, all people will be mourning because of him. That's what John just said. Go back to what we read in Revelation, that last verse we just read. We get it again. Behold, he cometh with clouds. We just saw that in the words of Jesus. And every eye shall see him. He told us they will see him. And they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail. They shall wail because of him. Even so, he says, Amen. Next verse. So John has just told us something. Behold, he comes. John has just connected us. And, and you remember, you remember the three synoptic 
Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all talk about this. When Jesus gave the, the message about his coming, they all wrote about it. They all said the same thing. John didn't write about this there. He didn't. In St. John's Gospel, you don't, find, you, you don't find this part of it. He doesn't talk about this end time stuff that the others dealt with. They gave details. John doesn't talk about them. But then John comes with another book and corroborates what the others said Jesus said. And he tells us from his own perspective. They were there when Jesus spoke. Watch. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord. Remember, he said, the prophecy, he called this book a prophecy. So now he's prophesying, John is prophesying. He's saying, thus saith the Lord, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. That's what he's saying. Did you notice that? Saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Glory be to God. Next verse. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Yeah. He was banished to the island. He had been put in prison. Then they sent him to this island to die. But while he was there, he got this wonderful revelation from God, which he was put in a book. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. It is because of the word of God. Because of the testimony of Jesus Christ, he was arrested for preaching, for preaching the gospel. Next verse. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, the Lord's day is what we call Sunday today. All right? Sunday. That was uh, the day after the Sabbath. So, back then... The, the saints picked that day because um, that was the resurrection day. He arose early in the morning after the Sabbath. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Look at that. Look at it again. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day which means that he was in a state of a vision, like being in a trance, all right? Like in a trance. He was in the spirit. So he's seen a vision in the spirit. And I heard behind me, so in the spirit, he heard behind him, which means he's not describing the geographical direction of that sound because he was in the spirit. He was in the spirit. So it's not in the earth that he was hearing the sound behind him. He was now in the spirit. So in the spirit, there are directions. He could tell in the spirit that the sound is coming from behind him. 
So he says, I was in the spirit of the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. It sounded like a trumpet. Remember, he's in the spirit. He can describe this. And because he's in the spirit, if you heard, if you heard a voice that sounded like a trumpet, you probably wouldn't know what it's saying with your, with your human ears. But he is in the spirit. He's in the spirit. And, and, and there are a few things I'm going to ask you, to, I'm going to point out to you as we get along in, in this chapter. Okay. With respect to what I just shared with you. Next verse. So he, said, he heard this voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What and what thou seest, what you see, he says, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in, now he tells us, which are in Asia, all right? This is Asia Minor. And he's, he gives us the list of the seven churches. Unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Interesting. Seven churches. Now, when we dealt with this, I showed you their locations when we dealt with this. So hopefully I'm going to, um, when I get into dealing with the, the letters to the churches, I'm going to show them to you again. The allocations and also the implication of the message to these particular churches. Next verse. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, see, he's in the spirit. He hears the sound from behind him. Sounds like a trumpet, but he understands the meaning of the words. So he turns to see who's talking with him and being turned, instead of seeing just somebody, he says, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Uh Uh-oh. That's interesting. Now, just so you can understand the, the, uh, what actually he saw, I want us to read this from the, from the um, JB, what's the Jewish Bible? Yes. Yes, the complete Jewish Bible. Says, I turned around to see who was speaking to me, and when I had turned, I saw seven gold menorahs. The menorah is a, is a, a candlestick with six branches, three on either side. Three on either side, and with a base. So, making seven. So, here he says he saw seven gold menorah. All right. Now, let's move to the next verse. And among the menorahs was someone like a son of man wearing a rope down to his feet and a gold band around his chest. Interesting. And his head and hair were as white as snow, white wool, his eyes like a fiery flame, his feet like burnished brass, refined in the furnace, and his voice like the sound of rushing waters. Uh Uh-oh. How come he didn't say the voice like trumpet this time? Right? Now, but it sounds like rushing waters. The King James would say many waters. See, rushing waters. All right. So, you go back to the King James and let's read it from um, that 
12th verse. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. I just wanted you to understand, because when you think candlesticks, I want you to understand what John actually saw, what, what it looked like, okay? It looked like the arrangement of the menorah. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and got about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. Wow. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. That's interesting. Doesn't that say something? His head and his hairs. Do you get it? We're white like wool, as white as snow. That's not describing the complexion of some, somebody in the earth. His head was white. His hairs were white. As snow, not Caucasian. Not Caucasian. Look at that. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. Remember, he's in the spirit. John's in the spirit. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. Next. And his feet like unto fine brass. His feet, not his shoes. His feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice as the sound of many waters. Like the CJB said, rushing waters. Remarkable, remarkable description. Remarkable. This. Remember, he's in the spirit as he sees what he tells us. Next. And he had in his right hand seven stars. He had in his right hand seven stars. Seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. This is a vision. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Not only was his head white, his countenance was as the sun shines in his strength. Think about the noonday sun. You can look at it. You can look at it. You can look at it. It's too strong. Next. But you see, he's in the spirit. He's in the spirit. You know, in the spirit, you can see symbols. You can see whatever you're shown. And you can understand if you're given the understanding. Because there's some things you can see in the spirit and you may not understand. In fact, John also had some of that happen to him even in this book. All right, let's go. And when I saw him, of course, of course, you remember Paul, Saul of Tarsus, on the road to Damascus, he saw this uh, light from heaven, and he described it, it was brighter than the noonday sun. And a voice spoke from that light. And when he saw that light, he says, he was blinded by the glory of that light and he passed out. He fell, he fell flat out. Now here, same thing happens with John. He says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, fear not. Fear not. I am the first and the last. 
Hallelujah. He goes on. Let's see, who is this? Who is this fellow? Who is this fellow? Who is this fellow that John saw? Whose head was white as wool? The hairs of his head white as wool. His countenance as the sun shineth in his strength. He says, I am he that liveth and was dead. Oh, now I know. And behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Wow. Remarkable. I am he that liveth and was dead. <laughs> and behold, I am alive forevermore. Never to die again. I'm alive forevermore, evermore. And have the keys of hell and of death. Next verse. Write the things which thou hast sinned. Oh, oh, no, no, no. I want you to see this. This is powerful. Write the things which thou hast seen. We just read all the things he saw, right? That's why he wrote them down. The things which you have seen. Remember, he just told us what those things are that he saw. So the master said, write the things that you have seen. What are the things that he saw? He said, I turned to see the one who spoke with me. When I turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And I saw one like the son of man standing in the midst of the candlesticks. He had in his right hand seven stars. Describe his countenance. Described his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet as burning brass. And a sword. From his mouth. Look at this. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are. The things which are. Uh-oh. What do you mean the things which are? We're going to know shortly. And the things which shall be hereafter. Okay. So the things which are, it means the things that are, that are in the now. They're happening now. The things that are going on now. Then it says, and the things which will be afterwards, hereafter. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. This is, this is huge. I want to take you through this. Now, move to the next verse. He tells him what they are. Look at it. Because I told you, uh, if, if you, if you listen carefully to the, to the verses very carefully, you'll see that the, all the details are so important because he, he gets to explain them as you get along. All right? The mystery of the seven stars, which... Thou sowest in my right hand. See? It says, write the things that you have seen. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sowest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. Then he tells him, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So write down. That one, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sowest are the seven churches. The seven candlesticks. So he saw the menorah. So here he says, those candlesticks are the seven churches. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Now, depending on the translation that you're using, the word 
is translated angels in some, in some messengers, some pastors, and so on. So um, those of them that use the term angels are a little misleading for, for a reason. Because the same word, actually, that's translated angel is translated messenger. All right? Angelos. It's translated messenger. But um, why you know that this is not an angel, like you would say, angel Gabriel? Like you say, angel Gabriel? How you how you should know is because he tells him to write to them. How do you, 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 you can write a letter to the angels of God, right? So these are messengers. This is the, the seven stars are the messengers of the seven churches. And, and the messengers of the seven churches, because they're called messengers of God that the ministers of God at the seven churches. And in fact, when you read Father, he addresses the message to the churches to these messengers of the churches, letting you know who they actually are. They, they represent those churches. So they're the pastors of those churches. Okay, the seven stars are the angelos, messengers. That's the Greek. Achilles of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sowest are the seven churches. Wonderful. So this concludes the chapter one of this book of Revelation. And it will take us into the second part. But let me give you the analysis here as you, you require. You would notice that from verse 10 to verse 19, those are the things which you have seen. The things which you have seen, they are described. He told him to write the things which you have seen. And those things are in verses 10 to verse uh, to 19. Then the things which are. Now the things which are, are chapters 2 and 3. When we enter into chapters 2 and 3, he starts describing the things which are, the state of things at the time. The state of things he describes. All that you'd find in chapters 2 and 3. And then the things which shall be hereafter, he describes from chapter 4 to chapter 22. All the way from chapter 4 to chapter 22, he gives you those things that shall be hereafter. And the significant thing about the hereafter is that um, he meant after what is happening now. You see it? After chapters 2 and 3, after the church has been here, hereafter, why, why is that simple thing? It looks simple, but why is it, why is it important? I'll tell you.
just um, a little bit of chapter two so that you, you, you capture some things. Just a little bit. Go to chapter two from verse one. On to the angel of the church of Ephesus. This is the first church now, all right, of the seven, the first of the seven. On to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write. So it's write to the angel, to the messenger of the church. This thing said he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of its place except thou repent. Wow. Did you notice what he said? Remove thy candlestick out of its place except thou repent. So the seven candlesticks, he says, are the seven churches, right? Did those churches know that they were represented before God as candlesticks? Did they know? Now, these were not the only churches in Asia Minor. They're not the only churches that were there. Now, he tells Ephesus to repent and says, if you don't repent, I will remove your candlestick from its place. If you removed it, would they know down in Ephesus? Let's, let's look at it again. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Interesting. Then he goes, For this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. I took some time to explain to you the Nicolaitans, who they are, and um, what their deeds were. And I'm going to do that again. I'm going to explain that again. I just want to take you into this because um, as I did the last time, chapters 2 and 3, I dealt with them separately. And that's what I intend to do because... Um, the he distinguished very clearly as I showed you what he called the things which are from the things which shall be hereafter. And I want to focus on those things which shall be hereafter before I come into the things which are. For one reason, the things which are today, I want us to look at them from reflections. Reflections of what they had back then. Okay, so let's go. Uh, last verse we just read. But these thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Here's another beautiful thing. Look at that. It says, him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life. This is that tree of life in the garden back in Genesis. 
And it says, this tree of life is in the midst of the paradise of God. Wonderful. So, where is paradise? It's in the paradise of God. Paradiso. Where is it? Where, where's paradise? Where's the paradise of God? Well, um, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. No, no, no. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. From verse 1. It is not expedient for me to outlast the glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God know it. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. Remember what he says. He was caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God know it. How that he was caught up into paradise. And heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. This is remarkable. This is remarkable. Oh, glory to God. Look at it. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Not lawful. He didn't say the words are wrong. It's not lawful for a man to utter them. If they were wrong words, they wouldn't be uttered in paradise. This is language in paradise. He's saying, I can't, I can't, I can't speak those words here. It is not lawful to say those words here. Because men can't understand. He said, I heard unspeakable words. <laughs> Glory be to God. I know what he heard. He says, it's not lawful for a man to utter. Because they're going to think you're crazy. You lost your mind. They're going to think you lost your mind. Unspeakable words. My brothers and sisters in Christ, we've got to learn kingdom language. Kingdom language. Because anyway, that's what we're going to be speaking. And, and the sooner you learn kingdom language, the better. Because most have been taught in the word, the language of the word. So they use expressions of the word. Imagine if, if already, just, just because of the language of faith that you have learned, which I would call first principles, okay? These, these, these fundamental things that you've learned when you speak them in your office or in your neighborhood or even in your family, and they say, what's wrong with you? Why are you talking like that? What do you think you are? They're already angry at you for speaking elementary faith language. So what's going to happen if you actually talk the real talk? What's going to happen? He was caught up in the paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Caught up. So I want you to observe, paradise is not some place in the Middle East. Paradise, the man was caught up in the spirit. Go back, go, go back, verse 3. Look at verse 3 again. Verse 3. I don't know what happened to the guy. He's not hearing. <laughs> and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell God know it. How that he was caught up into paradise. All right? Read it from verse 1. We'll get it in 2, but read from verse 1. It is not 
expedient for me, doubtless to glory, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. So it's, it's, uh, he's dealing with spiritual things here. He's dealing with spiritual things here. Then he says, I, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. You see that? Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And in the next verse, he in verse 4, he describes the third heaven as the paradise. Because the man was caught up to the third heaven. Go back to verse 2. He says, whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth such an one caught up to the third heaven. He was caught up to the third heaven. And in verse 3, uh, verse 4, and I knew, no, 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 verse 4, how that he was caught up into paradise. So the third heaven is paradise. Glory to God. Okay. And then I remember dealing on this subject. I talked about the first heaven, the second heaven, and the third heaven. Right? Okay. So probably in the course of this uh, discussion in the book of Revelation, I'll talk, uh, talk about it again, hopefully. Ma, ma, ma. Now, one of the things you're going to observe carefully as we get along is the symbolisms in the prophetic visions of this book of Revelation. The symbolisms, very important. So often the vision, as uh, when you follow the, the narrative, you'd find there are interpretations of these symbols. So always be clear that you are reading you're reading not the actual uh, uh, characters, okay? Not the actual characters themselves, especially when it tells you that it was a sign or a symbol. If it was a sign or a symbol, then you have to wait for his interpretation. For example, he told us, a moment ago, in the right hand of the one that was speaking to him from behind him, there were seven stars. Seven stars. The man had seven stars in his right hand. And it turns out those stars were people. You see it? Those stars were people. They were, they were actually characters who were to be receiving letters from John. That's interesting. So the, the symbolisms are very, very vital. The way they appear in the spirit isn't the way they are interpreted in the earth. You have to allow the interpretation to be given by the angel who was sent to John to deliver the message to John. Now, some of the interpretations are right in the book some others you would find not directly in the book of Revelation. You have to go to Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, uh, Isaiah, and Jeremiah to find them, and including the book of Psalms. See? So that helps you with a more accurate knowledge of what he wants us to know. Glory be to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. There are things that are happening in our world right now that will require understanding. For example, um, this, because he gave us the authority for it. Let me explain to you. In the book of Genesis, he put Adam 
in the garden. And he said to him, take charge of it. The Bible says he asked him to dress it and keep it. To keep it meaning to take charge of it. And he let the devil in. He let the devil in and listened to the devil. And, you know, uh, the rest is history. Should have never let it happen. He was told to be in charge of it. That was his job. But he committed high treason against God for letting the devil control him. Should have never happened. And we in our day must not make the same error. He has given us the name of the Lord Jesus. He told us watch and pray. You see, watch and pray. Understand this. This world belongs to Abraham and his seed. And the Bible says, if you belong to Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs of the promise. This is the truth. As we study God's word, we understand what belongs to us and how he wants us to live. We also see what kind of a life we're supposed to be living. And listen, this is our day. And according to the scriptures, this is our world. Because it's Abraham's word. He willed it to Abraham and his seed. And in this period of time, he gave us the name of Jesus with which to rule principalities and powers of darkness. He gave us a name that is above every name. He gave it to us. And we have to use that name to put the devil where he belongs. And that's why this week we're fasting and praying. We're fasting and praying. We'll pray for the nations. Yeah, you say, Pastor Chris, but we've been praying for the nations. Yes. I tell you, um, there's a war. And in the war, there are different battles. See, there are different battles. There are different fronts. Different battles. They haven't given up in their attempt to control this world. They have, even on the, on the COVID thing, they haven't given up. They were defeated, but they haven't given up. And it's not like we are, we are expecting them somehow to give up. Satan doesn't give up. You just have to put him where he belongs. He says, you shall tread upon serpents and upon scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. That's what we have to do. We have to put him where he belongs, under our feet. We're going to use the name of Jesus. Use the name of Jesus. Use the name of Jesus. Satan shall not lord it, lord it over my country. You say that. You declare in the name of the Lord Jesus, Satan shall not lord it over my nation, my country. Then mention the name of that country. Satan shall not lord it over my city. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he shall not. I forbid him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you declare, I break the influence of Satan. I break his influence over my country in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And over the leaders of my country, he shall not have influence over them. Declare in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You declare it. You declare it. You declare it. He will not use the legislature. He will not use the justice system. He will not use the executive. to the future that the Bible talks about and what is going on in our world and how we can keep our world in check by the power of the Holy Ghost. And those in the occult, they know that what I'm saying is true. They know. Except those in the junior classes who are deceived. Those in the senior classes, they know what I'm talking about. They are scared. Yes, they wish to be free if they could. But this week, it is possible for you to be free. 
It's possible. You don't have to be afraid of anyone. You can be free. No evil shall befall thee. Mashokaraba. Speak in tongues, everyone. All of you who have received the Holy Spirit, wherever you are right now, speak in other tongues. Pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Pray in the Holy Ghost. You are releasing power into the spiritual atmosphere. Speak in tongues. Mande glora sata karabade gola manda braso ta kilo gros de parinas legronigos ko shalira bakason tele baradikos kolahai. Now the choir come up here as we as we pray. Just pray everywhere. Pray everywhere. Libra nongos kisho sara dila kronte kalamaningas rata kabasate kele mante koradahia. Your word is eternal. Your word is eternal. Masete korasi karababaye lengronongos kibranente kila mandora zakora doske kila grasto kila grasto mandola grese. Speak in tongues. Bring the Holy Ghost. Bring the Holy Ghost. Bring the Holy Ghost. We are the children of the living God. Manda karabaka setele lehaya. Ragos kasora baka sora baka sora baka. Radele gedele broske tora mande. Ligra doske parabia mangle mini mangle mini krusha jaka rabaka sete. Lelo kuso prodigo baka rabaka dikesho. Biro <laughs>